Oh, good, they got the slide to show up well. All right. Uh, <clears throat> title of my slide is Measuring the Measurements. We need data. What you see in the bottom is a slide that you find whenever you make a presentation at Johnson Space Center. In God we trust, all others bring data. Now, I'm going to be showing you a lot of data here, so be a little bit patient. And let's see if I can get my time to work here because I do want to keep within track of the time. Let's see, next slide. Uh, last fall, I, was, uh, test I had testified at the New York City Council. This is sworn testimony. They were going to be passing a bill that wanted to reduce greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050. This is a copycat legislation that's gone all over the place. Lots of states have enacted it. However, there are no penalties involved. So it's maybe wishful thinking legislation. But I was the only person testifying about the measurements they were using. They were basically going to save energy. They were going to burn less oil, use less natural gas. They were going to seal the windows on City Hall, do lots of things that would save energy. But CO2 is not a valid measure of energy. And yet they wanted to tag the success of their program to the CO2, quote, reduction. Well, CO, if CO2 is a, what measures energy? I'm going to show you a couple of slides here. Uh, and I'm going to run through these really quick. You have uh, British thermal units, kilowatt hours, joules, uh, calories. Uh, let me go back here again. I'm not so sure this is working right. Uh, electron volts. These are all energy me measures. CO2 is not in that list. These are grabbed out of a, a, a textbook, a physics textbook. Uh, and, and here's the proof, basically. The, this is a wind farm in Holland. This is a wind farm on a dike. They produce electricity. They produce no CO2. So you can't measure their success by any CO2 they're producing. It's the same with solar cells. Now, top you see the Gem Solar uh, plant in uh, Spain, 19 uh, megawatts. Uh, this is a, a farm, uh, solar cells that power a farm. Th these power a guy's roof, uh, and I found out that they power his, uh, his microwave and two light bulbs. And, uh, and it's OK, you know? Uh, and, and he's able to feed it back into the, into the grid. But again, they produce no CO2, so CO2 is not a valid energy measure. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you a, a fair amount of this, this graphic. This is an enlargement of part of the Keeling curve. It's seasonality of CO2. Now, why does it go up and down? Well, in April, which is right here, the, uh, the, the plants in the northern hemisphere uh, green up. Uh, leaves come on the trees and they absorb CO2. You know, CO2 is going down until around October when the leaves fall and then the cycle starts again. This, this is what happens in the Keeling curve. Now, plants, when they start greening up, they ingest water, which is hydrogen and oxygen. They ingest CO2, which is carbon and oxygen. They create hydrocarbons for their structure and then they release C uh, oxygen for the rest of the world. Uh, it, the perfect symbiotic relationship between the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. And here, we are trying to monkey around with it and change it. Bad move. Uh, this is the long-term look at all those little squiggles. Each of the tops of these are all April and goes back down to October. And you'll see a trend that goes uniformly up with a couple of little blips. Here's one right here. We actually see it going down. Turns out that's Agung in uh, the big volcano in Indonesia that went off. And there are a couple of places where you have little spikes here. This happens to be a volcano in Guatemala. And <clears throat> Professor Plimmer, an Australian professor, has said that these volcanoes can, in and of themselves, generate more CO2 than humans have ever done in history. And he's right, except that volcanoes impair release of CO2 from the oceans, and the net effect is actually negative. Uh, Later on, maybe in the q and I'll get into some detail if you, want, if you want that. So here is the thing that makes meteorologists get all excited and crazy. It's hurricanes. This happens to be uh, Isabel. Uh, hurricanes are the perfect example of uh, molecular phase change, heat transfer. If you're a meteorologist, you get excited about hurricanes. All right? <clears throat> now, so here we have the President of the United States sitting in a, in a swamp in the Everglades talking about all the additional hurricanes, that they're stronger, there's more tornadoes. And the fact is, I hate to say it, but the president is clueless about climate. 
all right? Now, that's not an opinion, that's just fact. And it, it's not an insult either, by the way. I'm clueless about stuff. I'm clueless about the uh, <clears throat> blood vessel structure in the wings of cockroaches. I just don't know. So I am clueless there. So what, what does the president do? He gets advice from people who should know better. Uh, that's a box of loose screws, by the way, okay? <laughs> and, and, uh, and these are the, guy, these are the guys who write his, write his speeches. Okay? So this is, this is the reality for hurricanes. Hurricane strikes in versus CO2. Now, CO2 is on the bottom going up 280 parts per million, going all the way up to 400 parts per million, which is where we are today. And it also happens to coincide with time because there's been a consistent rise in CO2. And you notice by the time we get down to McKibben's 350, we're doing really well. And if you add more CO2, we're doing even better. The fact, now, do hurricanes increase the viscosity of the atmosphere to, to or CO2 increase it so you don't get less hurricanes? Nah, no. Nah, maybe they do, but someone will maybe look into that. <clears throat> Here's another one. This is a concept called accumulated cyclone uh, energy. And what they do is they, they take a hurricane or a tropical storm, and every six hours they measure its wind speed, the, its size, and they come up with a statistic called accumulated cyclone energy. Uh, NOAA correctly says that over the years, there's really been no trend, all right? However, the last 15 years, there's been a decided drop as CO2 goes up. Now we have accumulated cyclone energy. So not only are there fewer hurricanes, but there's less, they're less strong. Uh, not what the president said. Here's again, I'm going to repeat this slide so you have a context of the CO2 going up through time. And more, and more screws, okay? Uh, Here's tornadoes versus CO2. Every category of tornadoes has been going down or flat as CO2 has arisen. CO2 is in the center here. Tornadoes, the, uh, the F2s, the 3s, the 4s, the 5s, are all either down or flat. So uh, here it is versus temperature, basically the same. Even if you take out the outliers, these little spikes up here and, and down here, you still have a decreasing tornado count versus temperature. Uh, here's precipitation. This is a neat slide from Anthony Watts's website. Uh, and I think Willis Eschenbach put this on there. What you see here is rainfall in the tropics. And here is the actual rainfall over time, over the last 100 years. There has been no increase in precipitation, even as CO2 has gone up. Uh, so <clears throat> let's, now this is the donut that formed, this is the floating ice donut that forms around Antarctica. Uh, it grows in their summer, uh, meaning our summer, uh, their winter, and then it shrinks a little bit. We've had this donut, this floating ice donut, at a record for the last 36 months, three years. Last uh, summer, it was 20 million square kilometers. Why is this important? Number one, uh, around its edges, you get clouds forming. Why? Because the ice is cold and, and, and the uh, <coughs> water vapor can condense into, into cloud. So you have an increasing radius of a cloud donut in addition to the ice donut. What it does is it changes 80% absorbing ocean and flips it to 70% reflecting ice, snow, and cloud. And the sunlight that's reflected from the ice, snow, and cloud is reflected at wavelengths that CO2 does not intercept which means it has to get colder, and it does. Got another slide to show you here. This is, uh, here you see the uh, clouds along the equator. This is the equatorial Pacific. And here, by the way, here's the, the clouds around the ice donut on, on, the, on the bottom of Antarctica. Uh, Essenbach uh, also says that there is a, a link between temperature and that cloud formation. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you a citation maybe in the Q&A. But the fact is, that reflects incoming sunlight, too. And you add them both together, and it gets colder. Uh, change albedo by just 1%. Albedo is reflectivity. And by the way, the magenta here is still white. Uh, they, uh, University of Chicago just uh, sets up magenta to show where the ice is floating versus uh, on land. Asia has had record snow cover for the last three years. Uh, and again, they had snow in Egypt last year, a foot of snow in Jerusalem. While the snow is on the ground, incoming sunlight reflects off. CO2 does not intercept it. 
So again, we have been getting cold. Have we really been getting cold? Let's take a look. Um, more of my friends at the EPA. This is the real strange stuff going on. These are contrails. Uh, EPA wants to regulate aircraft emissions. After 9-1-1, we had four days where no planes flew. The net result was higher highs and lower lows because the albedo of these uh, high uh, contrails just wasn't there. And the albedo works both ways, by the way. It also redirects heat down. And the widening in the temperatures, you know, EPA is concerned that you know, our climate has wide swings. Why would they spend a nickel on EPA and on CO2 emissions from aircraft? Uh, these are the guys that are doing it. Uh, uh, sorry, folks. Uh, I apologize to the monkeys. They don't deserve that. <laughs> All right. Let's go. No te temperature. Uh, last 18 years. Uh, this is a worth of six months. Anyway, let me go back a little bit here. I use this graphic, and the environmentalists say, no, time. you can't do that. You can't do that at all. So I say, why not? It's just too short. It's too short. You have to go longer. You have to go longer. What do you mean longer? Uh, if I go long, yeah, that's a, you're cherry picking. You're cherry picking. You can't do that. So what do I have to do? Well, you have to use the president's national climate assessment. Huh. Why? OK, well, I'll show you why he wants to do that. And that's what it looks like. That was out of the climate assessment. There you begin to see a correlation with temperature. That's why he wants me to use the climate assessment. The, uh, the, the top of the graphic, uh, the mistakes here, by the way, and I'll nitpick them later on. But here, <clears throat> you have correlation of CO2 and, uh, and temperature. Uh, not here, actually. Here you have temperature dropping and CO2 rising. So two thirds of this is correlated. But I can understand why he doesn't like the present and wants to go back. Let's go back a little bit further. Let's go back 2,000 years. Now look carefully at this graphic. Here you have a CO2 line, which is flat as a pancake, at 280 parts per million, shooting past the medieval warm period, little ice age, having absolutely no perceptible impact whatsoever on temperature. And then in the end here, when we start burning coal and oil and stuff like that, yes, we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere, and it just happens that we are rising in temperature again, probably going to another medieval warm period or present warm period. But the impact, and by the way, if I go back 10,000 years, that this is still 280 parts per million going all the way back. You could sight on this line and with one bullet get one of uh, Governor Cuomo's deer. It's that straight. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Here's Aguam. Notice the little spike upward because of added CO2, and then you actually have a diminution of CO2. And in the Q&A, I can get some more detail on that. I'm going to use this little subset in, in the following graphics. This is an important slide. Here we look at sources of CO2. This is natural. This is human. And then you add them, and you get a total. This is the percent natural. 97%, and again, most of it is outgassing from a warming ocean. 3% due to humans. This is an IC, IC, uh, PCC chart, by the way. And again, total 100%, minus reabsorption. Remember, all those plants suck it in every year. The net increase on a yearly basis is literally 1.5%. Not a lot. Let me do that graphically, and maybe it'll be a little bit more understandable. Between these two years, 61 and 62, this is the annual increase. The next year, we have a little bit more. We get 11.7 billion metric tons addition out of 793 in total that's emitted. So the, the, the little thin blue line is the addition that we have to uh, CO2. And our efforts to reduce it don't even fit within the thick line here that I put. It's not that thick. I couldn't make the line thin enough. It's actually probably in the molecules of the top line. So all the billions of dollars that we're spending have that much impact on CO2. Uh, <clears throat> how about the Department of Energy? These guys are even crazier. Uh, carbon sequestration, they stick. Uh, first of all, the research is only $1.6 billion, all right? Uh, they pay $200 million to store 1 million metric tons of CO2 underground. And they're storing it underground is a tremendous, colossal waste of money. 
Okay, here's our messages. Measurements, matching metrics. CO2 does not ma measure energy. Match the measurements of the rhetoric. So here we got Obama talking about more hurricanes with greater energy. Well, the fact is, that it just isn't true. If you took a lie detector test, by the way, and stuck Obama in it and put electrodes on him and everything and, and, and figured out what he's doing, I, he would be telling the truth. He really believes this stuff. He just doesn't understand it. And <clears throat> so, 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 so what do you do? You have to tell the truth. Now we get the third, we get EPA and, D, and DO. And by the way, Obama may believe, all right, that they, there's more hurricanes. We believed that we could get to the moon. But we also had data. We had hard data. We had measured data, calibrated data, that told us that we knew we were going to get there, and we did it. That's how we got to the moon. There's one other thing we did. And I'm going to take some time here to talk about Hal. Every astronaut who ever went up owes his life to Hal. Why? Because he and his team figured out the resonance problems between the fuel delivery system and the rockets that was making them blow up. And Walt, probably the bravest astronaut we had in the darkest days of Apollo, it was Walt who went up in the newly redesigned Apollo 7 and with the hopes and prayers of a nation, rocketed into the heavens and into the history books. This is the right stuff. And if you want to see integrity, intelligence, and courage all wrapped up into one, go to these guys later on, look them in the eye, shake their hands, and give them a good salute, because they deserve it.